I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to be in dialogue with you, Jonathan, and especially grateful that having this dialogue on my calendar forced me to read your book. In fact, one of the reasons I accepted this invitation was because I knew that it would ensure that your book wouldn't sit on my shelf for months or years before I finally turned to it. Um, for those of you who don't have a copy of it yet, uh, here it is. It's big. It's thick. <laughs> it's uh, got about 550 pages of text, and it's precisely the kind of book that I often tell myself that I don't have time to read. but you know, as I mentioned to you, Jonathan, before we got started, um, this book miraculously is an easy read, a truly enjoyable read without sacrificing depth and nuance. Um, what a surprise. <laughs> and there are other surprises in this book, and I want to get to some of them. But before we go further, I want to admit that I was a bit reluctant to read this book for reasons that were completely unrelated to its size. Um, I had read many of the glowing reviews and I knew that the book would make an important contribution in many ways. Um, after all, you know, it's true that it's the first major comprehensive biography of King in more than a decade, incorporating thousands of newly released FBI documents and other materials and interviews that haven't been included in previous work. But I, I was a bit worried about the book. Um, over the years, I've grown worried and weary of the, you know, big men of history narratives, um, as they often glorify individual men and play down the role of ordinary people, especially women, in shaping history and building and leading movements. And this has been especially true in so many of the narratives told in films and magazines and books about Martin Luther King. So. When I saw uh, that this book was being published, my first thought was, you know, do we really need another book, another biography about Martin Luther King? Um, you know, of all the stories that are still begging to be told about the Black freedom struggle, is King's story really the one that deserves our undivided attention right now, that, you know, deserves mine? And in recent years, I've been overjoyed to see the publication of books like Barbara Ransby's biography of Ella Baker and the publication of Jane Crow, um, the brilliant activist and civil rights lawyer, Polly Murray, um, her biography. And um, I appreciated the fresh take on Rosa Parks herself, you know, in the wonderful book, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. So I found myself really kind of struggling with like, do we really need another biography about King? And that was the question that was rolling around in my mind when I began reading. And I'm happy to say that once I reached the final page, my answer was yes, yes. We needed another biography and we needed yours. Um, there's so much in this book that corrects the historical record in important ways and that humanizes King rather than glorifies him and that takes seriously the political and intellectual contributions of his wife, Coretta. And I also wanna say on a personal level, that I was struck by how the book, especially at the end, speaks quite directly to the hope and hopelessness that I feel about the future of our nation at this moment in time. Um, I found it sobering. Um, I guess that's the word sobering <laughs> to realize just how deeply depressed King was at the end of his life and how much difficulty he had seeing a way forward for himself and our country as a whole. So I guess what I'd really love, you know, as we begin is for you to answer the question that I was asking myself when I first opened your book. Um, you know, why King? Why were you moved to write another biography about King? Um, and why now? What about the story feels especially important and relevant now? And I'll steal in part the question that my friend Karitha apparently asked you very recently, as you confessed to me. You know, really, what is what does his story mean to you personally? Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just let you take it from there. 
Wow. Thank you so much for your kind words and for being here with me today. And as, as a huge fan of your book, it's just an honor. Um, and, and I'm glad that you ask these tough questions. Um, as, as your friend asked me earlier today, she insisted on knowing why personally, you know, this mattered to me. And my life has intersected and been shaped by King's work in ways that I didn't imagine I didn't understand for a long time. I mean, I'm born in 1964. So by the time I start going to school, um, I'm pulling up I, I, in an all white neighborhood in suburban New York. Um, but when I pull up to school, there's a bus full of black kids and a bus full of white kids side by side looking at each other. I can literally remember that the first day at school. Mm-hmm. So integration is happening. There's a moment, I think at that moment, there's still this hope that America's changing. Uh, there's still this, we're still, still waiting to see what the effects of King's work and this movement, not just King, but the entire movement, what the effect is going to be on this country. But there's still a moment um, where it seems like we might be moving away from this system of uh, control over uh, the people who have been um, victimized for hundreds of years. And that doesn't bear out. Uh, Our hopes are dashed, but nevertheless, my life is shaped by that moment. And the way I progress through school, um, the the people I'm going to school with, all of that is shaped by this moment in history. So by the time I'm, you know, 50 some, 40 some odd years later, working on a Martin Luther King book, or starting to get ideas about working on a Martin Luther King book, um, a lot has gone into shaping that idea. And to answer the, in the most basic way, I was working on my Muhammad Ali book when I found myself interviewing people who knew Martin Luther King. I was found myself talking to Dick Gregory and Andrew Young and Harry Belafonte and Reverend Jesse Jackson and asking them what it was like to be around Martin Luther King. I just couldn't resist, even though I wasn't writing about it at the time. But I recognized that we had essentially turned him into this very safe figure and and that was doing him a disservice. Um, and this is something that really happens again in the course of just the last 20 or 30 years since the national holiday is created. Um, we have, you know, the government in effect has, has taken over controlling the, the version of his life that we get. And we get this watered down version. We lose sight of the radicalism. Uh, we lose sight of the challenges that he posed to us. We lose sight of the fact that he was criticizing not just um, segregation, but racism, in economic inequality, um, mm-hmm. materialism, militarism. And when we, let, when we let the media, when we let everybody basically um, reduce his story to this sanitized version, we're doing him a disservice. So I felt like because I had this opportunity to interview people who knew King well, because there were thousands of pages of new FBI documents, because we're living in a world in which everything he warned about has come true, um, we, we desperately needed a new biography. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I'm curious, you know, whether you feel like you as a white man bring a particular lens to the story. Like, do you, do you, do you, did you at any point in the process of doing interviews and conducting the research and trying to figure out how to craft and tell the story? Did you at any point, like wonder to yourself, like, would someone who is black bring a different perspective to the story than I might have? Or were you kind of approaching it with sort of your official journalist hat on and just asking yourself, oh, like, what's the most compelling story here? I'd like to think that I could get away with just keeping the journalist hat on, but that mm-hmm. just doesn't really work. And you have to be a human and you have to be uh, sensitive to the subjects you're writing about. And any biographer really is taking a huge leap mm-hmm. of faith in this act of, you know, um, audacity, chutzpah, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it, uh, to tell someone else's life story. But for a white mm-hmm. person to tell an iconic black person's story is extra uh, chutzpah. And that's why I did not just feel like I had the right. I first asked the people who knew King whether they would help. Then I asked a lot of scholars in the field if they thought that we needed a new book and if they would help. Uh, of course, talked to lots of my friends about it. And some of them, you know, asked me lots of tough questions. And I, I really had to think about it a lot. Um, and I don't think I would have engaged in it. I don't think I would have, uh, if it was just the journalist hat and I hadn't asked those questions and really sought the help of a of the community around me, I don't know that I would have dared to take on the task. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to spend a minute exploring the relationship between King and the broader Black freedom struggle. Um, 
you know, he's often characterized as a charismatic leader, someone who is the leader, you know, um, leader singular <laughs> of the movement. Uh, that's the impression that I think most school children get. Um, certainly the version that my kids have been taught in their public schools. And I think it's a story that's most familiar to most Americans. And while there is some truth in that version of the story, there's also much that's obscured and distorted. And so this brings me to Dr. Vincent Harding, uh, who you discuss briefly in your book. Um, he was a dear friend of King's, and he was also the author of King's Speech at Riverside Church denouncing the Vietnam War, you know, the speech that earned him <laughs> ire and condemnation from nearly every newspaper in America and many of his friends and allies. And um, I had the joy of meeting Vincent towards the end of his life, and he became a friend and something of a mentor to me. And he once made an observation that I've been thinking about ever since. Um, I was discussing his book of essays about King entitled Inconvenient Hero. And he said something like, you know, the thing that you need to understand is that the movement shaped King as much or perhaps more than he shaped it. And I think in saying that, he was pointing to how much King changed and grew between 1963 when he gave his I Have a Dream speech and 1968 when he condemned the Vietnam War and was assassinated. And Vincent's perspective seemed to be that the young people in SNCC in particular, but also in the Black Panther Party and in the streets of Watts, forced him to grow and evolve in ways that were painful, but that also made it possible for him to exhibit the kind of moral clarity and courage that he did when he condemned the Vietnam War and vowed to build a poor people's movement. And I guess I'm wondering if you agree with Vincent's assessment. Um, do you agree that the young people of the movement, you know, even younger than King, shaped King, grew him up, so to speak, forced him to face truths about this country and himself that he might not otherwise would have faced? Um, you know, do you agree that the movement shaped him as much or more than he shaped the movement? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and just the fact that Dr. Harding wrote what I consider King's greatest speech tells you something about King's leadership style, that if, 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 if being a great leader means like sitting in the boardroom and making the big decisions or drawing the, the battle plans, then King was a terrible leader. If being a leader means listening to the people around you, reacting to them, um, following them sometimes when they have a, a big idea, then King was a, a, fa a fabulous leader. King never sought to be in the lead of anything. He was, you know, pretty much pressed into duty in Montgomery and felt like he had to do it because he was asked. Uh, he had just turned down an invitation to join the board of the uh, NAACP in Alabama. So he was not looking for any new responsibilities. And then all of the moments that we think of as being his greatest moments were really moments that he was called in to help, um, movements that he didn't really start. And, and King's genius was his ability to call attention, focus moral clarity, um, challenge the nation, and challenge all parts of the nation. You know, something about, and, and the, the, the younger, the SNCC people and, and um, other protesters, you know, the, the people riding the, the Freedom Rides and everything else knew that if King arrived, the media would follow and that the dynamics would just go up. Everything would be heightened all the tension would be heightened, the danger would be heightened, and the publicity would be heightened. So King had this ability to really focus the nation's attention. And that's um, what, what made him a great leader, not so much the, um, the strategizing. Sometimes he, he, he knew that others were better at that. Well, who or what do you think most influenced um, King's kind of growing radicalism, I'll say, for lack of a better word. I mean, you know, I, I, sometimes people characterize the 1963 version of King as like less radical. And in some ways, that's true. Um, at least the task at hand was a narrower one. Um, but trying to dismantle a legal system of racial apartheid in the United States is hardly a, you know, a reform goal. Um, you know, that really was uh, a radical, like, you know, unimaginable um, goal for many people at that time. But there is no, you know, at least my reading of, of your book and others that I have read, you know, makes clear that 
there was like a militancy about King that emerged towards the end of his life and um, an edge, not just to his rhetoric, but to his analysis and that his own thinking deepened and broadened. And I'm curious, you know, as he began to critique militarism and capitalism and um, take on um, the larger economic and political structures um, more explicitly than he had in 1963. And I'm curious, like, who and what do you think were most influential um, for King as his own thinking and uh, ways of being in the work evolved? I think the biggest influence is God. I think that's fundamental. I think he grows up reading the Bible and becomes committed to preaching what it says. And that's where the, a lot of the radicalism comes from. That's where the attacks on militarism and, and materialism and inequality um, come from. When he talks about America being the greatest purveyor of violence on earth, that's that's all rooted deeply in the Bible. And, and I would argue a little bit with those who think that he only got radical in the last few years. I think we just didn't see that radicalism because even when he's busy um, in St. Augustine and, and Albany, Georgia and, and Birmingham, he's still traveling across the North to raise funds. And when he goes to the North, he's complaining about the Northern racism, the Northern segregation. He's using these opportunities to challenge his audiences, not just to raise money um, by calling out the segregation in the South, which would have been easier. He's really calling on them to con consider their own consciousness and it's not until he has enough bandwidth a little bit later that he begins to really uh, address those issues more formally and to put them at the top of his agenda. And when it comes to who is inspiring that, Coretta, for sure, right off the bat, it's Coretta when, he win, when they win the Nobel Prize. Uh, and I say they uh, win the Nobel Prize, it's Coretta who says, we have a greater responsibility than ever now. We can't just focus on voting rights and desegregation. We have to focus on the whole the whole planet we have to focus on poverty um that's you know she's pushing him all the way and even people who push him early on people like um like Bayard Rustin who arrives in Montgomery and says you know we got to take this national king leaves him behind leaves him in the dirt you know he's more radical than Bayard Rustin by the end um Rustin's telling him you know stop talking about Vietnam stop talking about mm -hmm. northern segregation because you're diluting your, our message but king says you can't dilute the message. It's the message that I, from, from the Bible. Can't dilute that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I think, you know, I, I can't speak for him really, but I, I, my sense is that Vincent would probably argue even more strongly that um, young people in SNCC and the people who had been rioting in Watts and all of that, really shook him and pushed him. Uh, his own thinking and analysis challenged him um, in ways um, that perhaps, you know, led him to think about his own theology in, in new ways. But let's talk a little bit about the historical record. Um, um, you know, earlier I mentioned that this book does a beautiful job of correcting the historical record in important ways, probably too many ways for us to cover tonight. But I'd love for you to share some of the discoveries that you made while doing research for this book. Um, discoveries that were somewhat surprising to you and that challenged popular perceptions of our racial history. You've discussed a couple of them in recent op-ed pieces. You know, one relates to Malcolm X. Um, you know, your research showed that King's harshest and most famous criticism of Malcolm X appears to have been fabricated. And maybe we could start there. Maybe you could share a little bit of not only what you learned, but, you know, why you think it matters. Well, the thread that runs through the some of the biggest revelations, and we can talk about Malcolm X, we can talk about um, the FBI's campaign against King and how complicit LBJ was. The thread that runs through that is really about who's controlling the narrative and who's attempting to control the mm -hmm. population um, because the media and uh, the FBI are really intent on maintaining the status quo in America. And that means dividing the civil rights movement. That means um, attacking and undermining the civil rights movement. And that means attacking King and undermining him personally as well. So um, in, in the case of the, the 
Malcolm X quote, I'll just describe briefly for those who haven't heard about it before. Um, the most famous quote we have um, from King when, when asked what he thought about Malcolm X comes from a Playboy interview that Alex Haley conducted. And in that interview, um, King is quoted saying that he believes that Malcolm's fiery demagogic oratory is leading no to nothing but strife for the black community. And, and King never actually said that. That quote was completely mm -hmm. fabricated by Haley for Playboy. And what King actually said was, I don't think I'm so arrogant as to have all the answers. And I certainly don't like to hear Malcolm talking about violence, but I don't think that, um, but, I, but I think we have more in common um, than we have apart. And by the time of, of, their, of their deaths, um, James Baldwin was saying that he thought King and Malcolm X had more in common than they did apart, that they, that they were practically indistinguishable. So we see them actually trying to come together a little bit in the last years of Malcolm's life. Malcolm goes to Selma and tries to see King and King is in jail when he gets there and talks to Coretta and, and Malcolm says, says to Coretta, tell Dr. King that I know what I'm doing, that maybe if people see how frightening I am, they'll be more inclined to deal with, with, with Dr. King. So mm -hmm. again, it's, it's about who's telling the story. Um, and we can segue right into the FBI uh, from there if you want, because we all know yes. now that King uh, was under the surveillance of the FBI. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy, JFK signed off on the, um, on the decision to, to wiretap his home phone, his office phone, uh, homes with his associates. And they began on the premise that they were looking for information that he might be under the influence of communists. Um, when it became clear that he was definitely not and that he was really trying to uh, you know, build a better American democracy, um, they switched and began targeting because of his, uh, his personal life, his sexual affairs. Mm -hmm. And that obsession really had no national security threat, obviously. It was about maintaining control of somebody who might be seen as an, ad mm -hmm. as an adversary. Um, you know, why the government casts King as an adversary when he's clearly, you know, a moral leader who's trying to... Um, make America live up to the words in the declaration. Well, I think, you know, while well, you write about that quite a bit in your book, um, it's, it's a matter of controlling the movement. It's a matter of making sure the civil rights movement doesn't succeed in undermining the status quo. Um, but the main finding that I uncovered, um, a lot of these FBI documents have been released in recent years and some of them have been reported on, but my biggest discovery was that um, JF, I'm sorry, that LBJ was being updated sometimes several times a week directly from, from Hoover. And LBJ was not only aware of the campaign, he was complicit in it. And he was in, in fact encouraging the FBI to leak some of this material to the media. So while LBJ is often portrayed deservedly as you know, a great partner with King in creating some of the most important legislation in American history, he was at the same time going behind his back and undercutting King. And, and that clearly affected their working relationship. Yeah. And I mean, to say that he was undercutting him is almost, you know, an understatement in this context. You know, I, what, you, what you, the story you tell, um, which is so powerful, just runs completely contrary to what we've been hearing for decades now. You know, for decades, historians and journalists and politicians and school teachers have, you know, kind of woven together the story of how, LBJ was a genuine partner with King, um, striving to achieve civil rights in America. And uh, at least until King, you know, denounced him and the <laughs> Vietnam War. But what you found um, and the story you tell here is much more complicated, particularly when the FBI, you know, communications like weekly um, briefings of LBJ are you know, brought into view, um, you know, the fact that he was really a co-conspirator <laughs> with uh, Hoover in attempting to discredit and undermine the movement at the same time that he was, you know, um, working potentially to broker some kind of deal um, through legislation or a truce of some kind. Um, and I'm curious, like, how you think this the this relationship that we now understand existed between Johnson and um, Hoover kind of changes or challenges some of our popular assumptions about 
um, how the movement won its victories. Um, and I'll say that, you know, I think one of the stories that often gets told is that, you know, it's very important to have positive relationships, you know, with your allies in high places in order to achieve change and that these relationships um, not only are important, but can be built in a manner that can be trusted. And um, the scope, scale, and uh, extent to which LBJ was involved in the surveillance and undermining um, of the movement with Hoover, I think um, really kind of complicates that narrative. And I'm kind of curious how you think that story changes or might change our understanding of what the movement was up against and who their real allies were. It's a great question. And, you know, we can hear a lot of the anecdotal evidence and then we can infer from there. Anecdotally, when, when LBJ becomes president, uh, makes one of his very first phone calls to MLK and says, we got to work together. And he calls him Martin in that very first phone call. And then within a year or two, he's calling him Dr. King and Reverend King and the relationship has changed. Why? King has no idea. It's not, he hasn't spoken out on Vietnam yet. That's not it. Why, when, when the riots erupt in LA, King is really shaken by this. And he calls Johnson, one of the rare times when MLK is initiating the call and says, what can we do? So they, they are working together. They seem to be working together and you know, they do pass you know, these two in, incredibly important bills. But I guess the question is, what didn't they pass? What more might they have done if the relationship had been a genuine one, if it had been a two-way street? Um, would King have been able to speak out on Vietnam and still call LBJ and say, this is what I have to do as a preacher. This is what God, you know, what my religious beliefs command me, but, but you know, we can still work together. Would their relationship have, have, have been strong enough to endure that? Would LBJ have been more supportive when King went to Chicago? Instead, King LBJ is gossiping with Mayor Daley in Chicago. We have we have all these. You can all all of us online here can when you get done with our with our, with this session can go listen to these calls yourself. They're all on the LBJ library. You can listen to these phone calls. And King and Richard Daley are, are backstabbing. I mean, sorry, LBJ and Daley are, are are talking trash about MLK. And maybe we get a better. Maybe we get a real Fair Housing Act. Maybe we get more legislation. Um, we don't know, but we just know that there's a sort of rot at the core of their relationship. Yeah, and I, I you know, I think for me in reading it, it was a reminder that when you're involved in really revolutionary movements, movements that are um, threatening to those in positions of power, um, the odds are high that even if they are, you know, in their public facing or even private conversations, um, presenting themselves as allies, um, there's a pretty good chance <laughs> that they are also working in various ways um, to undermine the work that you're doing. And that's not necessarily true if the work that you're doing is just reform work, tinkering with the machine here and there around the edges. But if you're building a movement that is destabilizing um, and, you know, potentially threatening to those in power, um, no matter what they may be saying to you on the phone or whether they're calling you Martin or Dr. King, <laughs> um, the chances are, are very high um, that they are also working in subtle and not so subtle ways um, to monitor, control or undermine um, the work that you're doing. Yeah, and I sometimes but, felt like um, King was maybe naive in that he thought politicians were going to behave morally. Yes, and I, I, I saw in one, I'm actually forgetting who was reflecting on this about in the, in the book in one point around, you know, perhaps King was naive to, to hope that uh, the politicians were coming and working from a a moral place and were operating in a genuine manner. And, you know, it reminded me actually that there were some criticisms like that of Obama as well, that, right. you know, he imagined that he could kind of waltz into the white house and have talks with, you know, <laughs> um, the folks on the other side of the aisle in which they could 
reach common ground if they were both open and honest and direct about what their shared uh, interests are. And um, so, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I could see how King, um, you know, was vulnerable to that critique, but he, at least in the narrative you tell here, there's very little evidence um, that King wasn't at any moment um, willing to risk it all um, for what he believed. So um, that's a form of naivete that could probably be <laughs> better characterized as moral courage. Yeah, we could use um, a little more of that kind of yeah, naivete. Yeah. Um, I'm curious if there are other surprises that, you know, are, are moments that you felt the historical record really needed to correct that emerged during the course of your research and writing that you want to mention? Well, you know, I feel like, you know, you talked about some of the other activists and how um, King was influenced by them. And, and Dr. Harding talked about that too. Um, I felt like we really can see how King was influenced by them and that um, even some of his own supporters and some of his greatest allies were at times reluctant to, to back him up as he, as he did keep his mind open and became more, more mm -hmm. radicalized or more willing to speak radically. Um, one of the great benefits, ironically, of these FBI wiretaps is that we get to hear a lot of King's personal conversations and we mm -hmm. get to hear him on the phone with some of his closest friends and advisors. Uh, we don't, I should say, we, we don't hear them. We don't have the tapes yet. They're scheduled to be released in 2027, but we have transcripts of the tapes. And Andrew Young um, and Bayard Rustin, who were on those tapes, say the transcripts are accurate. They, they've listened, they've, they've, they've read the transcripts, they recalled the conversations. But we can hear King really struggling. You can hear him struggling emotionally. He's, he's depressed, he's exhausted. He's, he needs a break. He's asking his doctors to keep him in the hospital longer. He goes in for a checkup. He asks if he can stay for a while. Um, you know, Coretta describes this as, as depression. Um, his mm -hmm. friends are trying to figure out a way to let him get away from it all. But at the same time, these friends are not really understanding him. And they're, they're encouraging him to make deals, to, 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 to stand back, stand down on yeah. Vietnam. You know, there's this one really painful conversation where King's talking to Stan Levison, who was probably his closest white friend and one of his really most trusted advisors. And Levison complains that he didn't like the speech um, at Riverside Church, that it didn't sound like King, um, that it was mm -hmm. too um, political, that it was taking on issues that were beyond his scope, and that it was you know politically unwise. And this is one of his best friends and King has to remind mm -hmm. him that you know he's mm -hmm. not doing this for political purposes. You can just hear, you can almost hear the pain mm -hmm. in the voice just from reading the transcripts. And he says, it might have been politically unwise, but it was not morally unwise. Right. And yeah. they just don't get him at that, even after all those years. Yes. I think I was, I was, I was very moved um, by what was just the evident like agony that he was in um, as he was being kind of betrayed and abandoned by friends and allies, questioned. Um, and also, it, you know, and I'm curious to what extent you agree with this. Like, it seemed to me that he was really having trouble seeing a way forward. Yeah. And, um, and at one point he, you know, says, something along the lines of that, you know, people just keep asking him questions for which he has no answers. And, uh, you know, that kind of, as I mentioned at the outset of our talk here, really um, was moving to me given where we are right now in our country. You know, people will sometimes ask at, you know, Black History Month events, you know, what would King say or what would King do? And, um, the kind of despair uh, that he was in about um, the difficulties facing the nation and the unwillingness of white Americans um, to be willing to make any sacrifices of any kind um, to address the you know, history of racial caste in this country, um, address the suffering of the poor, um, and to move beyond kind of platitudes and 
uh, the elimination of, you know, just the kind of the veneer of, of, of caste um, was really striking. Um, I have to say that in your telling, even the poor people's campaign seems like uh, a little bit of a unstable idea <laughs> where he's kind of spitballing and trying to come up with a grand plan that would meet the magnitude of the challenge that our nation was facing. Um, but I was struck that, you know, at one point he says in a meeting, something to the effect of, you know, he's reflecting on the fact that they need to have, you know, tens of thousands of people registered and they only had 20 <laughs> to, to go to Washington yeah. DC yeah. to participate. And, uh, people were challenging him on, you know, what are you really going to do when you get there? And how are you going to deal with the potential that people aren't going to be, you know, acting nonviolently? And what really are you, what are your actual demands? And asking him really, yes, challenging questions, but I didn't experience them even as antagonistic, as, but really kind of saying, what really is your game plan here? And him seeming not to have clear answers, even his own mind to some of those questions. Um, and so, I don't know, did, did, did you get the sense that he was kind of unraveling a bit at the end? His friends said they, they felt like he was, that he was spiraling into depression and losing confidence. Mm -hmm. And you can hear on some of the tapes, uh, or again, the transcripts, that, that he's losing confidence, that he says people aren't, going, aren't listening to me anymore. And especially after the, the riots in, in Memphis, he felt like people were he, people were never going to listen to him again, that because mm -hmm. violence had erupted at one of his protests, that he had lost all credibility. And yet he was mm -hmm. still really committed to the poor people's campaign and to the vision of it. You know, he he always threw himself spitballing was your word. He th always threw himself into these situations, figuring that something good would come from it. So he threw he parachutes in to St. Augustine, he parachutes into Birmingham, right? And, and knowing that like something good will come because we're stirring the pot and that's what, that's what he's best at. And he still believes that he can do it again one more time, but it's his most audacious bet really because he's not just calling for something specific like you know desegregating the buses or desegregating the economy um, of, of, of a particular place. He's trying to try, he's trying to shift the entire civil rights movement into a human rights movement. He's trying to call attention to issues that go beyond race and look at you know some of the bedrock problems of American society and, and American economy. And he doesn't have a plan for how to do that. He just thinks that if he occupies Washington, he can call enough attention that something good will come of it. And, and that's as far as the plan really goes. Yes. Yes, that's definitely the impression I got that having kind of been willing to take the step of condemning militarism and challenging America's imperialism and materialism and questioning capitalism, all of that, that recognizing the scale of the challenge and being willing to publicly name it, um, the question then of what to do. Um, especially when he was, his own credibility was plummeting and he was under attack from all sides. I think, um, yeah, uh, it's, 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 uh, it, it's, it, it's fascinating that he was able even <laughs> um, at the end of his life to continue to, to push forward in the way that he did and challenging people to try to take, you know, really revolutionary direct action um, by occupying Washington in a way that he did when um, there were so many challenges facing him personally and politically at the time. Yeah, at this point, he knows that the government is trying to destroy him. Um, he knows mm -hmm. the government is trying to break up his marriage, um, pushing him to commit suicide. And yet here he is. And maybe again, this is naive, but he really thinks mm -hmm. that he can go to Washington and convince America, convince the government that we can live up to loftier ideals, that we can we can do these things, we can we can create a more just society, we can we can really make income inequality go away, and he knows it's the right thing to do, and, and he's still trying, even though you know you got to believe he he understood exactly what he was up against at that point in his life. So I have um, 
one question that I really want to ask you, but there's also some questions coming in in the chat. Um, so let me just ask briefly, and then I'll switch to what's coming in in the chat here, which is, I'm curious, you know, also, if you, well, if you could just say a little bit about Coretta King's influence and role, um, you know, many of the reviews have noted, and I agree that your telling of the story helps um, to paint a clear picture of what an intellectual and political partner she was um, um, to King. And uh, I'm curious if you could just say a little bit about what you learned from both the interviews that you were able to conduct, as well as some of the new material um, that you accessed about her relationship with King, um, but also her own political and intellectual views and the influence that they had on the movement and perhaps the influence of other women that perhaps didn't get their due. Yeah. Um, King really fell for Coretta, I believe, because she had this great resume as an activist. You know, she had more activist experience than he did when they met in Boston as college students. And she was um, pushing him all the time. At the same time, he was not giving her the chance to really contribute in the way she wanted to. He expected her to be the, the, the minister's wife and to stay home and raise the kids. And, um, and they, they bickered over that sometimes. Um, she admitted as much in her memoir that she challenged him and said, you know, I feel called to serve too. And his response was, your duty is to the home and to the children. And um, mm -hmm. she had to accept that. And she says over and over mm -hmm. in her memoir, and, and I also was able to get a hold of tapes that she made while working on her memoir, um, tapes that she recorded while working with the ghostwriter and editor. And she, it's like, she repeats it so many times, and that too I had to accept. And that too I had to accept. Mm -hmm. She had to give up her career. She had to give up her activist work. She had to mm -hmm. um, accept the fact that women were not recognized and respected in the movement. This is one of mm -hmm. King's biggest... Uh, blind spots, one of his biggest prejudices. Mm -hmm. you know, he is and should be recognized as one of our great moral leaders, but he he failed um, to recognize the contributions of women, including his own wife. And, and then, of course, you know, he had mistresses and, and Coretta uh, says she didn't believe it, but she surely must have known about it. And that, too, mm -hmm. she had to accept. Yes, yes. Well, let me pull in a couple of these questions that um, have come in. One of them relates to public speculation about who um, who killed King, and asking whether um, you have you know uh, any questions about the official narrative and um, who do you believe killed him, and what's the best evidence for whatever your theory or belief is. Well, I think it's very clear that America and the FBI in particular created conditions in which somebody might want to assassinate Dr. King. In fact, there were memos written just months before his death, FBI memos saying we must create, we must um, treat him as the most dangerous um, Amer American. And um, that, that if, if, a, if a black messiah is able to unite the community, um, they, they, the threat would be too great to risk. Um, so they created those conditions, whether they, uh, I know the family, the children of, of Martin Luther King still believe that there was some kind of a conspiracy. They don't believe that James Earl Ray acted alone. Um, I did not spend a whole lot of time investigating that because other whole books and congressional committees have already done that. Um, but I have not seen in, in recent years, anything new to alter our understanding of the assassination. Okay. Um, another question relates to, um, Alex Haley's characterization of King's quote relating to Malcolm X. Uh, Terry asks, was King aware uh, that Haley had fabricated the quote? Did Haley ever count for his distortion? Yeah, it's a great question. Nobody ever called him out on it. So I'm guessing that if King even read the whole, whole article, which he probably wouldn't, they were his words. He thought this is, I already said this stuff. Why should I read the article? Nobody called it to his attention, and he had a lot of bigger, a lot of bigger things on his plate to worry about than a journalist, you know, misquoting him a little bit. I guess um, that's my hunch. Uh, but Haley was never called to account for it, and um, I think it's um, unfortunate. But at least it's better late than never. Yeah, 
And David asks, you quoted King at one point as saying something to the effect that people of the South should go to Chicago to quote, learn how to hate, end quote. Do you think King was surprised at the vitriol of whites in the North when he was based in Chicago, despite his prior experiences at Crozer VU, et cetera? I think there was a lot about Chicago that surprised King. And he'd certainly been in the North, you know, he'd studied in the North. He traveled extensively throughout the North. But when he moved to Chicago in 66 and saw the level of hatred um, that, that, you know, white uh, homeowners in particular in, in the Gage Park area had when, when he attempted to bring integration, I think he was, he was really stunned. And um, he was also stunned by the lack of receptivity from Mayor Daley that, that you know, he thought he was coming to Chicago with reasonable proposals for ideas that would actually make the city more um, livable. Uh, for everybody that, that, you know, there were, there were things that you could do to improve housing, improve education, and uh, in particular, tear down some of the segregation. And he was surprised at just how, um, how bitter that, that uh, those proposals, how bitter the, re the reaction was to those proposals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I'm curious if you think that King had other blind spots that perhaps haven't been well explored um, in the narratives that have been told uh, about him so far. I mean, clearly uh, his sexism and the uh, sexism that he brought only to his marriage, but the movement um, is one of them. And we've talked a little bit about his kind of alleged naivete um, in dealing with politicians um, and perhaps in his hopes that white people might actually be willing to sacrifice more, change more um, than they ultimately were. Um, do you do you think that did you did you come to sense that he may have had other blind spots as well that haven't been identified or explored? Yeah, you know, he was twenty six years old when he finds himself pulled into this position of leadership, and his goal at that point was really to lead him lead him a, a church for a few years and then become a teacher. He wanted to be a college professor, maybe a college president someday. So he had a lot of blind spots when it came to organization, um, you know, planning. And I think that sometimes that, that, you know, maybe the political naivete plays into that. He wasn't trained for any of this. He was making it up as he went along. And, um, you know, he was being called time and again to, to you know, make these huge commitments. Um, and, and he just kept trying to do the right thing, but you know, he never figured out how to really successfully raise money without going him personally and making speeches. Um, so there was no business plan really. Um, he, he wasn't thinking about taking care of his family financially. He was just you know thrown into this thing and never really got a good grip on what he was thrown into. I feel like. Do you think his class background being kind of a uh, he certainly wasn't wealthy by any means, but having more of a middle class background um, was one of the things that made him a bit surprised or unprepared for what he encountered in Watts and in some of the other cities where so many young people not only had never heard of King, um, but were absolutely unwilling to entertain the possibility that there was a nonviolent solution to the level of like struggle and suffering that they were dealing with and the level of oppression that they faced. Yeah. Do you think his class background um, contributed to any blind sure spots or biases? And you know, some of his friends said that King wasn't bruised by racism the way a lot of them were, that he had been somewhat. Mm -hmm blows had been softened somewhat because of the way he was raised. At the same time, that's also what allows him to, to lead the way he does, you know, and to, and to attempt to speak mm -hmm. to so many diverse audiences, to inspire mm -hmm. people to march with him, to inspire, you know, regular churchgoers to turn into activists and to have white audiences listen to him um, because he seems like he's reasonable, uh, even though the message may be radical. He's, he has this unique ability, really, and I think some of that comes from his upbringing, this unique ability to speak to blacks and whites. And, and, and mm -hmm. so there's some trade-offs there. Yeah, he maybe loses mm -hmm. some of the um, ferocity or the ability to really 
you know, put a little fear of God into people the way, you know, Stokely Carmichael might. But the, the trade-off is that King has, is able to attract a bigger audience and to open more minds. Yeah. One of the questions that um, came in is, do you think that listening to the audio tapes when they become available might alter how they are being interpreted just from the transcripts? Might such thing as tone of voice, nuance, um, lead to other interpretations? Yeah, there's no question that we are waiting to see just how much the FBI was spinning some of these things. If the transcripts are accurate, as um, you know, people like Andrew Young say they are, it remains to be seen whether the memos are accurate. So when they're, a lot of what we have are, are memos describing King's conversations, describing King's activities, and we'll find out whether those are, perhaps we'll find out when the tapes are released. I did speak to a couple of Justice Department officials who had listened to some of the tapes and they said that much of it's indecipherable. And some mm. of the things that are some of the most um, frightening, um, disturbing um, allegations about King, um, they said that they did not bear out from listening to the audio tapes. So we'll, we'll see. One of the things that struck me, and I guess I had known this before, but in your telling, um, I, I paused to think about it a little more deeply, I guess was the fact that the FBI gave to all these media outlets, um, I guess, audio as well as mm -hmm. memos describing King's infidelities and very, you know, lurid and graphic ways. And the, the media like, universally just chose to sit on it and not to publish what they had learned. And you know, it's hard not to conclude that that really did alter the course of history, their decision um, not to publish what was on those tapes. And I, it, it's almost impossible to imagine the media responding in a similar way um, if delivered that kind of information about uh, anyone in the public eye today. And you know, I'm curious what your understanding is of why they made that choice and like what the ultimate impact was. When, you know, King had to wake up every morning wondering if this was the day that some newspaper reporter was going to print the story that they'd been fed by the FBI. So imagine the impact that had on him. Also think about the fact that every newspaper reporter and editorial writer knows this is out there. And how does that taint the coverage of King? So, you know, you mentioned earlier that when King gave his Riverside speech church, it was savaged by the media. They told him he didn't know what he was talking about. He wasn't qualified to speak about international affairs, even though he had a Nobel Peace Prize, I should say. But um, how much of that negativity from the media is influenced by the fact that the smear campaign is going on and, and reporters aren't printing it but they're sure gossiping about it. So, you know, we give the media some credit for not running the story, um, but they, they, they deserve some, some scorn too, because they could have reported the bigger story about the surveillance of King. They could have reported that the FBI, yeah. our, our nation's law enforcement was using it, it tax dollars to try to disrupt the civil rights movement and destroy one of our, you know, moral leaders. So what is your understanding of why all of those media outlets made the same choice, why they didn't publish, you know, the lurid details or any details about King's affairs, um, which would have certainly been damaging. And also why it's a little bit easier to understand why they didn't publish um, the fact of the FBI surveillance. But I'm curious if you have any sense of what the motivations were or if there were debates about that. For the former, I think it was the standard of the day that these things were private. We didn't report on the president's affairs. We didn't report on our athletes' affairs. And um, we didn't report on our, our local mayors or our newspaper editors who were having affairs. Uh, these things were considered sacrosanct. So um, I think they felt like if they reported on King, um, even though you know there's, there were plenty of double standards for, for Black people at the time, this was one line that didn't get crossed. And... Um, it, 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 it still boggles my mind that there were no, there were no journalists willing to risk uh, standing up to Hoover and the FBI by publishing the story sooner. It wasn't until 1971 
when some activists stole documents from the FBI and released into the media that, that people finally began to report on the surveillance? Yes. Um, so there's one last question that I'll give you from the feed here, which is, was there any reason to believe that King knew his fate, that he may be assassinated? Um, journal entries, et cetera, that might reveal such a knowing. I know there's been a lot of speculation for years that, you know, King kind of knew his time was coming. And in, in your telling um, of his story, I think you show quite well that he was kind of preoccupied sometimes, or at least very conscious of the fact that he could be killed at any time and that it was quite likely that he would die a younger man than an older one. But was there any reason to believe? Did, did you come across any evidence suggesting that King knew that his time was likely to end soon? Well, his home was bombed with dynamite, shotgun attacks through the front windows. Uh, he was stabbed in the chest. He was punched in the face by attackers, separate attackers on two occasions. He got death threats in the mail, probably weekly. So it was not, um, it was not, you know, unrealistic for him to think that that someone might come for him. And he certainly knew that the FBI was creating conditions that would um, encourage such an attack. He'd seen JFK assassinated, when, and, and when the news came on that night, he told he told Coretta, "That's what's going to happen to me." Um, mm -hmm. So he was he he was given to those thoughts because, in part, because he had already seen it happening, and um, and I think he also felt like this country is not does not really treat favorably its 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 voices uh, its prophets its people who call for change its radical leaders and um, sadly he was right yes yes well thank you so much for um, this conversation Jonathan and for the work that you have done um, in producing this book like I said. Um, it was more than worth the effort. And I learned a tremendous amount reading it. It's um, one of those experiences where you think you know the story and um, then you come to realize how much you didn't know um, or had been, or had forgotten or um, how much the story has been framed in ways that aren't necessarily um, accurate and, you know, support narratives like you said that are much safer um than true to king's much more radical vision and uh his willingness to risk his own life um to try to achieve it so um thank you again for your work and for the dialogue that we've had tonight thank you michelle i appreciate it